Hello, good evening, everybody. Welcome to this session of 45th Comprehensive Course on Echocardiography. We are going to move on from basics to and we moved on from basics to adult echocardiography. And now today we are going to talk about congenital heart diseases. Absolutely a different ball game. Why it's so? Because uh, the structures which you have to identify, they do not come as labeled one. There are certain characteristics of these structures which you have to identify to label them as left atrium, left ventricular, right atrium, right ventricular accordingly. So that is the most difficult part of this particular congenital heart disease. And for that reason, I have divided this part into two parts, two parts in the sense, like I'll be showing a live demonstrations next week. And today I'm going to talk about the sequential examination of these subjects. So that's what is so that the doubts get clear. And when you start doing pediatric echocardiography, I'm sure like even if you pick up ASD, VSD, PDA, coactation of aorta, that's more than enough from any basic echocardiologist to talk about all these kind of things. Moving on, why I said journey of a congenital heart disease because it's in a multifold. And that's how I say a journey of congenital heart disease. Look, this is where we started when we had our country in 1947. The steam engine was the most important part of our, any travel in railway. So the diagnosis of a congenital heart disease is most important thing for identification of various structures. And for that, I always say these words from the legend in pediatric cardiology with the name of Joseph Perleff, who said it represents an epitome of applied clinical knowledge. When correct inferences are drawn from accurate observations, diagnoses are made with gratifying frequencies. What does it mean by? He says, you have to apply your clinical knowledge to assess or to evaluate particular structure, what that structure is. And when you identify that particular structure, and then you look for a shunts, and that's how you make a diagnosis with perfections. And pediatric echo is one, or neonatal echo is one, where you cannot make any fixed observations. Anything can be possible with the grace of a God, with the mercy of a God, any structure can form in a proper way or malformations. Next important issue is in approaches fetal versus perinatal circulations, looking at intracardiac pressures, sequential approach, an important consideration before starting doing an echocardiography, and then classification, and finally, whether to sedate or not to sedate a child. So we start with the journey of fetal, and that's a perinatal during a bond, when the child is born, and then finally to adult circulations. So the fetal is different, the child who's born is entirely different, and when it grows up in adult circulation, that's a different thing altogether. For this, we have to understand a few very, very important basic physics. What's that physics is? These are the only arteries which carries a bad blood or deoxygenated blood back to placenta. When this blood gets oxygenated from placenta, it is being carried by umbilical vein. Again, a negative thing, vein nevic never carries and oxygenated blood, but it does happen in fetal circulations. This umbilical vein carries a blood which bypasses liver with the name of ductus venosus. With this kind of a ductus venosus, it does not go into the liver and bypasses it to come to right atrium. Now, majority of this, I'll show you when I'm showing the slides, 
majority of this blood is shunted from right atrium to right ventricle, left atrium, right atrium to left atrium through a membrane, which in ruminant becomes eustachian valve or carry network. Some of the blood goes to right ventricular and that goes from a, the pulmonic artery. Now the lungs are not mature. What does this blood does? Some amount of blood goes to lungs that like I said in 15% out there and rest of the blood bypasses the lung circulation through ductus arteriosus. We are very comfortable in saying PDA. What is PDA? PDA is when ductus remains patent, that is patent ductus arteriosus. But ductus arteriosus presents a significant role during fetal circulations. So majority of blood which goes from a left ventricle is bypassed through ductus arteriosus to left atrium and goes to left ventricle and then to aorta. On the other hand, some blood has gone from right atrium to right left atrium. That also blood circulates into left atrium, left ventricle and then aorta. And now a lot of blood goes into the brain and that's why the, when the child is born, the child is born almost with a complete brain development. Then the blood goes in descending aorta, finally carries through umbilical arteries back to present. So that's what exactly happens when we have a fetal circulations. If you look at this fetal circulation very carefully, majority of blood is coming from right atrium and right ventricle. So they're relatively bigger than left atrium and left ventricle because they're not getting blood from the lungs. They're getting a blood either from a ductus arteriosus or the foramen ovate. So RV, RA preponderance is present. Now let's try the child cries and the, uh, the obstetrician or the nurses, they chop up these arteries, one placental umbilical art vein and two placental art umbilical arteries. As soon as these veins are chopped off, the system, what does it happen? There is no flow which is happening through this umbilical vein through patent ductus venosus. So this starts shrinking down completely. And this in turn subsequently becomes ligament of teres. Now the blood has gone to right atrium and right ventricle, and now the pulmonary circulation opens up completely. So what exactly happened? The child bounces. The first thing the child does, and many of the pediatricians who always work in the neonatology unit, they always look at only one thing. When does the child cry? How soon the child will cry? And how and did the child took longer time to cry? And what exactly happens? It all depends on oxygenation from the lungs. So what exactly happens? The blood goes from right atrium to right ventricle, then to the pulmonic artery to the lungs, and now the lungs purify that particular blood, sends back through pulmonic veins to left atrium and left ventricle, and now the blood goes to the systemic circulations. As soon as the LVLA pressures they built up, the so-called foramen ovale gets closed down completely. As soon as the oxygenation of the blood increases, this ductus arteriosus starts closing down. I don't say it closes down immediately, it starts closing down. So the shunting which was happening at the liver level with the ductus venosus becomes ligament of TVs. Fossa valis, it starts closing down or remnant is ASD. Ductus, venos, ductus arteriosus, it starts closing down because of oxygenation. This is ductus arteriosus, <coughs> which closes down completely over a period of time. And now these umbilical arteries, they are chopped up and which we often see in the umbilical regions. Let's move further. Fetal circulation differs from adult. How? The in adults, obviously, we know the lungs are playing a part, whereas the fetus is placenta, which plays a part. The shunt is at the level of placenta, promenoveal, ductus arteriosus, ductus venosus, and in dimensions of cardiac chambers, 
lungs receive only 15% of blood, hence pulmonary artery are very, very small. Couple of pediatricians who are there in this particular program is, they know as a child is born, they hear a pulmonary super. What is that pulmonary superfluous? I always give this example. When heavy rains happens on the top of your roof, what happens? You hear a murmur through which the water is draining the pipes. Why so? Because the amount of blood which is posed to those pipes, amount of water which is posed to those pipes is much larger than the caliber or the lumen of that those pipes are. Because of that, water wants to gush through those pipes and you happen to hear a sound. Similarly, when a lot of blood is being gushed through pulmonic artery, which were very small in the development phase, and those gush of blood in those pulmonic artery presents as pulmonic flow marble. Nothing abnormal, because that's going to disappear over a period of time. Once these pulmonic artery get accustomed to these large amount of blood flowing through them, on the other hand, RV is bigger than LV. Obviously, a lot of blood was coming to RV from those system. Now, over a period of time when the child is born, LV becomes predominant than RV. RV pressures, they are identical to LV pressures. Hence, we find ECG changes in newborn with right-sided preponderance and ECG changes so thing like an RV. The primary changes in circulation after birth is the shift of blood flow from gas exchange from placenta to lungs. Interruption of umbilical cord results in increase in systemic vascular resistance, result of a closure of very low resistance placenta. Closure of dextrose venosus due to lack of flow from placenta. Now the lung expense resulting in reduction in pulmonary vascular resistance, increase in blood, pulmonic blood flow, fall in pulmonary artery pressure, then functional closure of foramen ovale because no blood is transmitting from RA to LA and the PDA closure happens due to increased arterial oxygenation saturation. So, right side, decreased RA flow due to closure of ductus venosus and reduced RA pressures. Left side, increased pulmonic flow and in that increased venous flow in LA with increased LA pressures. Now, let's talk of cardiac pressures and why they are important, you'll realize them when we'll talk of individual lesions. Well, this is 70%, this is saturation. This is saturation. The mean RA pressure is only three. RV pressure is 25 and this RV pushes the blood against LA. So the RV systolic pressure is 25 and RV diastolic pressure is 10. On the contrary, LA pressure is 6 to 8, and LV pressure in the newborn is almost 55 millimeters of mercury, and it rises up to 120 over a period of time. Many of you sitting over here, it's only the LV pressure which increases or changes. Rest all, they remain stable. Look, and RA pressure, 3 to 5 we use like, in normal RA pressure, RV pressure remains static at 25. LA pressure remains static at 8 to 10. And only the LV pressure which rises over a period of time as the child grows. Now the next part of a journey. Next part of a journey is, how do we identify these structures? That is sequential approach. And this is the most important part of my talk today. We have to identify the visceral situs. Atrial situs, atrioventral concordance, ventricular localization, and a great artery connections. The first and foremost is visceral situs. Maybe at one time, I'm trying to fold a paper and trying to tell you how these things are going on. So when I say I'm going to show you, you can click on my image to look what exactly I'm trying to show you so that the image becomes bigger. Visceral situs. Atrial morphology, ventricular localizations, base to apex, levocardia or dextrocardia, great artery connections in individual forms. This I'm going to show you live next week. We go to subcostal window. All of us have been doing a subcostal window till now. How do we put up transducer? We put a transducer at three o'clock index marker. 
and transducer is almost flat to abdominal wall. Instead of keeping flat to abdominal wall, we keep at 90 degree to the abdominal wall. What exactly happened? We do a cut section as we do a cut section of CT scan across the abdomen. If you do a cut section CT scan across the abdomen, what do you find? Here is a spine. Look, the patient is lying in front of you. The patient left hand side, this is left hand side. Patient right hand side, this is right hand side. Through which you are interrogating the structure is anterior and the distal structure is posterior. Now, look at me. If I'm using with this abdomen over here, I'm going perpendicular, left hand side structure is aorta. So here is aorta over here. Right hand side structure is IVC. So here is an IVC over here. So these IVC and the aorta, they are in relevant position for individual persons or majority of us to talk about. And you can see my spine, if you happen to look, all these big structures, they lie on the spine. One left hand side is aorta and right hand side is IVC. And all of you next tomorrow, once you go back to your class, certainly you can do this kind of a structure. Instead of subcostal being parallel, just go perpendicular. And once you'll go perpendicular, you'll find aorta and IVC together. Now, next many people, they can ask me, like, how do we identify aorta and IVC? Well, aorta is always a pulsatile structure. IVC will show a respiratory variations. And what do you mean by pulsatile? You put a sample volume, pulse wave sample volume in this particular position, what you'll find? You find a systolic murmur, then early diastolic reversal, and then late diastolic forward. You'll find a triphasic Doppler spectrum pattern in this patient. And on the contrary, if you keep a sample volume over here, you'll find a respiratory evasion. Ask the patient to hold his breath completely. And then take a deep inspiration. What you'll find? Suddenly, there's a gush of the blood flow, a positive Doppler shift seen in that flow. Once we do this at 90 degree, we try to angulate a transducer gradually. Like gradually means, I'm sure all of you are drawing, doing a driving job. Once driving to hospital or a college or a clinic, wherever you work, what did you do? If you take a left turn, how much you turn your steering? Just minimal. Same is happening over here. We start moving from perpendicular to a normal conventional window, which we see in day-to-day -day practice. What will happen? As I start moving in a conventional window, like gradually getting become parallel, this IVC will start opening like a longitudinal structures. As it opens into longitudinal structures, it gets connected to a structure which is morphological RA. I always say these words, God has till date never ever done this. He has connected the IVC to LA. It's a fixed, whenever the IVC will open, IVC will always open in right atrium. So the first step is perpendicular 90 degree. As you angulate, your footprint starts looking towards your anteriorly or towards your face from perpendicular position, what you find, you start finding an IVC and the structure is morphological LA. Well, I do not believe which is morphological LA or morphological RA. I have to have my own prediction of identifications. What's my prediction of identification is? I said it has to have a eustachian valve. Eustachian value is attached to superior margin of IVC. Look, our image is upside down. So our margin is superior margin of IVC. And what does it does? This membrane, which so-called excretion membrane, gets connected to intraatrial septum so as to direct whole of the blood from right atrium to left atrium through this fossa ovalis. And many of you must have visualized the remanent is eustachian valve, and sometimes you can be long carry network present over here. Now the next question comes. We started with this. 
we started with this and now in subcostal window once we start looking in the right atrium i have to slide my transducer to other side of the in the apical window now this is the most difficult part of any pediatric apical. and in this transformations i have to look at my chest i have to move from a subcostal window gradually to my left apex so what does it do i gradually move my transducer from this space point to apical window now i know this apical window has morphological ra that is a fixed structure so once you are moving from a subcostal window to apical window you have to keep this ra into your views i know it's a most difficult thing which you ever encounter in your life but if you do it gradually as you angulate your transducer very gradually if you do the same thing looking keep on looking at ra and then comes to this particular position which is now almost apical four chamber view where this is structure is this on this side and the other structure is left atrium so this is known as morphological left atrium and the characteristic of morphological left atrium is what the characteristic of morphological left atrium is drainage of pulmonic veins now mind my words this drainage of pulmonic vein could be there or could not be there is not a fix because we have learned in a previous time is we have total or partial pulmonary venous drainage abnormalities if you look at them it's good if you can't find them you just cannot ignore saying that this is not a left atrium and the second part of a left atrium is the most consistent which has got not changed till date is left atrial appendage if you angulate entirely anteriorly you will find the left atrial appendage opening over here either in four chamber view or in two chamber view or in subcostal window you can see the left atrial appendage now moving from this 90 degree then anterior angulation of a tip of the probe or probe footprint we look at this particular structure of morphological ra and other structure moving from this plane to this apical four chamber view other structure is morphological la here's a picture which is trying to tell you left right anterior posterior here is my spine look this is pulsatile structure so it has to be an aorta and ivc is very small hardly seen over here now if you move my structure now hopefully the structure moves and as soon as it moves the structure this ivc opens over here and then this is an morphological ra and this morphological ra we can only look for a eustachian valve or a carry network which connects the superior margin of ra ivc to the interventricular septum in the superior margin only of interventricular septum of fossa ovaris directing a blood all from ivc to ra and then to left atrium now next thing happens we always talk of d loop versus l loop what is d loop versus l loop is during normal embryogenesis a straight heart tube folds into right now look at me a straight heart tube fold into right now just zoom up my image you will be able to understand my image much better than sitting over here this is a straight heart tube image get disturbed yeah as soon as i bring my image over here it gets disturbed the straight heart tubes folds to the right is showing a little bit and comes and occupy the left side of my chest i hope the image comes in up yeah i'll show back again the straight heart tubes folds to the right and comes and occupy the left side of my chest 
I'll show you live when I'm showing the live demonstration. So what does it happen? The four tubes folds to the right, that's so-called a DLO, then prefers to occupy a position in left side of the chest so that RV develops anterior to LV. And the base to apex axis points toward left side and the most of the cardiac mass lies in the left side of the chest. So this is what we talk about. What is the implication of this? The implication is when you open up your IVC, this is a morphological structure, RA. And when you go to a subcostal window, your left ventricle should point to the right, left. RV and RA, they are anterior to the left. Now look, this is anterior and this is LV. RV and RA, they are anterior to the left. It means what? It's sinus. Su this is something which is known as D loop for our day to day practice. If the initial fold of the heart tube is on left side, what I was talking about is if my tube folds to the left, I said right. So tube folds to the right, comes and occupy left side of my chest. If the tube folds to the left and comes to occupy left side of a chest, that is known as situs solitus with L loop. So what does it happen in L loop? This LV would be directed in this direction. So at your level, situs solitus with D loop, this is how the tube looks like. Now, once you have identified the morphological RA and morphological LA based on those structures, now the question comes, which is morphological LV, which is morphological RV? Now, here is, this is morphological RA, this is morphological LA, and we have identified based on left atrial appendage and the pulmonic venous drainage. If I do slight counterclock with rotation on this whole chamber view also, I'll be able to see IVC opening it. Now, we have to identify valves. We have to identify chambers. First of all, we identify the valves. The apical displacement of tricuspid valve, apical displacement mean, I'll try to hold this film for you. This is the attachment of mitral valve. This is the attachment of tricuspid valve. This is known as hinge point. So the apical placement is tricuspid valve is apically placed as compared to mitral valve. So if I have to talk about which is mitral, which is tricuspid is in that case, I have to look at this attachments to interatrial septum. Mitral valve would be superiorly placed as compared to aortic uh, tricuspid valve, which will be apically placed. If that is so, this is RA is identified, the L is identified, the mitral valve is identified, tricuspid valve is identified. Now look at LV. Look, just think LV is bullet shaped. It has got a papillary muscle and it's clean shaven. It's not Rakesh Gupta. It's Dr. Kevin, who is absolutely clean shaved person. It's a bullet. You can look at it. You can see a papillary muscle over here. That is the V. Then it's, there's no endocardium, like uh, accessory muscles or the tuberculations in the LV apex. On the contrary, RV small triangular structures attached to LA, LV, and it's heavily tuberculated and there's no papillary muscle. Bearded, RV, non-bearded clean shaven is L. So that's what exactly is said on this side is tuberculated cordae inserted into ventricular septum, infundibular muscle or moderator band, which is seen over here, triangular cavity and tricuspid valve is relatively apical assertion as compared to mitral valve. On the contrary, Left ventricle is smooth surface, two papillary muscles, which you often see in lateral and intermedial, and then ellipsoid geometry, two deep plate of mitral, mitral valve, 
relatively placed with the basal insertion or superior insertions. Okay. I showed you a picture where this is LV, this is RV. This is LA, this is RA. This is basally placed, this is apically placed. Thou, RV, RA, they are dilated. Now look at this picture over here. This is morphological RA, this is morphological LA. This is left atrial appendage. So there's no doubt that this is LA. There's a pulmonic venous genesis is also seen over here. This could be variable, but this is morphological LA. Now look at the insertion of these valves, leaflets. These are apically placed as compared to mantle valve, which is basally placed. And this is clean shaven, and this is heavily trivacolated. So what does this show? It shows that left atrium is connected to right ventricular through tricuspid valve. Right atrium is connected to left ventricular through mantle valve. This is known as atrioventricular discordance. If they are in this situation, LA to LV, atrioventricular concordance, LA to LV, RA to R. Correct? And if the cross reaction happens, left atrium is connected to right ventricular and right atrium connected to left ventricle, this is known as atrioventricular discordance. Now the second important thing is, before we move further, look, before insertion, of this tricuspid valve and mitral valve, there's some potential space over here. And in normal subject is up to seven millimeters. Next subject comes from LV to RV. What does it arise? Great arteries arises. And now the God has given a very good things in echocardiography is if you look at this kind of a pattern where aorta is in the center and the pulmonic artery wraps around aorta, in normal heart, what does it happen? If you look at me, the aorta arises like this, goes up, goes posteriorly and pulmonic artery wraps around aorta to bifurcate. The same thing is seen in this particular image over here. Aorta is in the center and the pulmonic artery wraps around aorta. This is known as normal great artery connections. And if you happen to see two vessel lines parallel to each other, seen in both the images where there's no, we could see only one aorta, or I can see at your time, if you happen to see two aorta, always think of a transposition of great vessels. Now the question comes, whether this is aorta or this is pulmonic artery. Whichever vessel you bifurcate with anterior angulation or footprint looking towards the shoulder, right shoulder, that is what is aorta will bifurcate. A pulmonic artery will bifurcate, aorta will never bifurcate. Until date, the aorta has not bifurcated and pulmonic artery has always bifurcated. That's a dictum. All right. So this is cup and saucer. This is central, this is LA, this is RA, tricuspid valve, RV, RVOT, and here's the pulmonic man, and this is the pulmonic artery comes over here, the pulmonic artery, left side goes down straight, and the right goes behind the aorta, and the aorta remains in the center. So this is a clip, it's not a clip, it's basically a static film, Talking about pulmonic artery, which bifurcates to right, and here goes the left. And this left pulmonic artery is connected to descending aorta for patent ductus arteriosus. Important consideration before doing an echo examinations. We have to classify them as synotic versus synotic. And what is important is you look at the nail beds or the lips of the two patient or the subject. If its saturation is below if between 85 to 93, our human eye will not be able to detect cyanosis. So what is the gold standard today is, all of us knows about it. It was not there 10 years or five years down the line. The COVID has made us learn more and more practical aspects of echocardiography as well as patient management as to check their pulse oximeter in upper limbs, lower limbs, or all the four limbs. In our lab, what we do, 
we always take a patient's height, weight in a body surface area. Then comes the oxygen saturation and then comes a blood pressure. And we have a different kind of cuffs for every age, like right from a neonate to mid uh, adolescent and then finally to adult age. Next question comes, increase versus decrease blood flow. What do you mean by increased blood flow? Suppose you have atrial septal defects. So what happens when you have an atrial septal defect? Lot of blood goes to the lungs. On the contrary, if you have a permanent stenosis, you find your lungs to be an oligomic. So that's what picture we say, increased blood flow versus decreased flow. If I happen to make a diagnosis of atrial septal defect and my lungs are oligemic, I have to think of two times whether I'm right or wrong. Then we classify these people as asynotic with increased blood flow or a normal blood flow, synotic with decreased blood flow or increased blood flow. Then what are the features of increased peripheral blood flow? The most common feature of this increased peripheral uh, pul pulmonic blood flow is the mom will get, but she sans pulta, the child is breathless all the times. He sweats, he's not growing. And I can see the ribs are being sucked inside when my child is breathing. He's tachypneic. He sweats while he feeds. He is short of breath. He is not growing at all. And this pusly chalti. And that's an objective sign when you have to see that there's increased blood flow in the pulmonic secretions. And that can be easily done by x ray chest. If you look at these kind of a lesion, we can divide them as synotic versus non synotic. Increased blood flow in asynotic is atrial septal defect, ventral septal defect, patent ductus arteriosus. Whereas the increased flow in synotic heart disease is total anomalous pulmonic venous drainage, TGA, truncus arteriosus, and tricuspid atresia. Decreases tetralogy of fellow as well as pulmonic valve atresia. In tetralogy of fellow, what we see, we see here pulmonic stenosis. So shunts, ASD, VSD, PDA, combined VSD and PDA, no shunts, coactation of aorta, aortic pulmonic stenosis or mitral stenosis. Synotic, we have a chunk of a synotic heart disease. We'll take that chunk after two weeks, after doing next week, we'll do a live demonstration followed by a synotic congenital heart disease. In synotic, as I said, Decreased blood flow is TOF or pulmonic atresia. Increases all kind of abnormality which you see in increase. Now, many people say whether we sedate a child or not. Look, I always say when we do a fetal or pediatric echocardiography is the most important thing is the mom, the patient, the doctor, all of them should be full satisfied. How they are satisfied? The mom, she already had a good food and now she is relaxing. Child who was crying for a long time and then you give them a sedation, fatty chloral, which is available in our country at the rate of 15 milligrams per daily body weight. So what we do, we give a time to a pediatric populations Call them a child at a time when the child is of sleeping time. We keep the child hungry for about two hours before our examinations. And then we give a trichloral phosphate, 50 milligram per kg body weight to look for a sedation. And during that time, once we give a drug, we always try to feed the child. And that's how we look at Most important thing, Apart from this is what we have learned practically out of this is both child and the mom should not be wet. 
what's mean by wet the mom should go to the toilet before taking up a child for pediatric echocardiography on the contrary child nappy should be clear because if the child is wet he or she is not going to say no to examination but they'll cry a lot during examinations and third doctor should have an adequate time for doing a pediatric or neonatal echocardiography he should not be jumping and running around to doing whether to look for a private patients whether to look for a icu patients whether to look for a ward patients and that's what have been published in das jas 2014 most echocardiographic diagnostic error among infant and young children are potentially preventable sedation is associated with lower likelihood of diagnostic error few imaging qualities errors and then fewer incomplete reports now the journey moves to the asynotic or individual lesions so before i start my asynotic lesion i would like to give a break for a few minutes even let me just have a cup of water and then we'll come back so let's talk of individual lesions in congenital heart disease which are asynotic amongst individual lesion and asynotic says we talk about left to right obstructive and valvular regurgitation lesions most common thing which you encounter in the day to day practice is asd vsd pda and endocardial cushion defects we can have a congenital aortic or mitral stenosis coarctation of aorta is very common pulmonic stenosis is also very common and isolated pulmonic stenosis are relatively rarely seen as compared with other associated tetralogy of fellow like lesions atrial septal defect could be primum secundum sinus venosus ivc type or unroof coronary sinus so no more three types of asd it is has to be a, at least six type of an asd three of primum secundum and sinus venosus then now five types then ivc of asd ivc type of asd then unroofed coronary sinus locations at the level of this is fossa varis this is secundum towards atrioventricular valve is primum away from atrioventricular valve is secundum or uh, sinus venosus which could be an svc type or ivc type so what has happened to pathophysiology if my shunt is present at ra level and la level so what will happen lot of blood which comes to ra will go to la then lv and then back to systemic circulation is that right or wrong it's wrong because lot of blood by intraatrial pressure left atrial pressure is more than right atrial pressure so lot of blood will come to the left atrium goes to right atrium through fossa valis or atrial septal defect then to right ventricle then to pulmonic artery and comes back to pulmonic veins to left atrium so chambers which will get enlarges are rv and then increase blood flow across tricuspid and pulmonic valve and you will find lot of blood flow which is coming through pulmonic veins so here is a parasitic short axis view at aorta look at this this is la this is ra ra is almost one and a half times of la this is rv which is almost bigger in size and is the pulmonic arteries if you don't look at this shun rv and ra dilatation will help you to identify look something wrong is happening when the things are getting volume overload as soon as you switch on a color flow you will find lot of blood which is flowing from la to ra same in four chamber view lv la ra rv and you can find a large intraatrial septal defect although this is not a picture correct to look at this blood flow because why why we are here in four chamber view we are parallel in scanning 
in two dimensional images, we have to be as perpendicular as possible. So this defect could be an artifact also. But once you switch on the colors, there's a lot of blood which is flowing from LA to RA, then to RV, and then to pulmonic circulation. Look how much blood is coming from pulmonic veins. An additional large amount of blood, apart from the blood which comes from lungs, from RV, since the blood has multiplied because of shunts. And we can take a peer pressures from this PR jet to assess the, the quantity of pulmonary hypertension patient has developed. At this point, it's very, very important because what happens if the patient's systolic blood pressure is 55 and my pulmonary artery pressure has gone more than 55, what will happen? You will not find any blood flow from RF ventricle, left atrium to right atrium. So we get a TR jet to assess pulmonary artery pressures. This was an era of 3D before when we used to look at subcostal window to assess their margins in atrioventricular and atrial rims, aortic, aortic rims, and then was atrioventricular and atrial rims in four chamber groups. Now today's circumstances, what we do we are utilizing a three dimensions echo to look for anterior, inferior, superior, and RV free wall margins to talk about whether this ASD is closable or non closable. Then, if you do not have any, if you have doubt or suspicion of interatrial septal defect by dilated RVRA, what do you do? We do an agitated contrast saline injection in the right arm of the patient to look for any shunting across interatrial septum in the subset of populations. Now, this is one variety of unroofed coronary sinus. Just I'll give the pass away. When the persistent left-sided SVC directly comes and drains to the RA, and thus before draining, it has the multiple fenestrated roofs. So if you give an injected contrast saline in left arm, it comes and opacifies the left atrium first, and then the right atrium, which is known as unroofed coronary sinus. Then we talked of SVC type of ASD. This is transesophageal echo. We talked of SVC type of NASD. This is transesophageal echo. And these two type of AC, ASDs are known as sinus venosus type of ASD. This is what exactly we have been doing now in day-to-day -day practice. This has been drawn from images. I made this little simple. What we look for, we look for a superior rim. We look for an inferior rim. Then RV free wall, and this is aortic rim. And we measure how much is the size of this particular rim and this particular rim. Many people has given many numbers of definition. SVC, aortic posterior, IVC, coronary sinus rims. So if you remember superior versus inferior, RA free wall and aortic rim, and that's give you an idea whether I'm going, can close this ASD or not. So take home messages, volume loaded conditions, significant ASD mean chamber dilatations, pressure of development of pulmonic artery, estimated by TR jet gradients, and higher the gradients, Poor is the prognosis. One word about ASD oblique PFO, I can only see this by showing you one slide that PFO in transverse of visual echo looks like this kind of number. This is limbus, which comes and put, which comes and closes this fossa ovalis. So if you do a transverse of visual echo, viva color, if you happen to find the flow across this limbus and like you can see by color Doppler over here, the blood is rushing from this point and emerging over here. This is known as for a patent for a man away. Just one word before we go ahead, we classify them as small ASD, medium size ASD, small and definite ASDs. 
anything less than 4 millimeter is for a man of whale, PF4. 4 to 8, small ASD, more than 8 is large ASD. And if you look at these kind of a things, what we teach at your level is PFOs, you don't need to close. Any ASD more than 8 millimeter in size, you need to close. 4 to 8 millimeters, we can wait, watch and see. WWS. Now, looks at change from ASD to VSD. VSD is little more difficult than ASD. How's that? I'll show you. We have a classification of ASD in the name of inlet VSD, outlet VSD, muscular VSD, and a perimembranous VSD. And the most common thing is a perimembranous VSD, which we see in day to day practice. This is Soto's classifications. It was published in 1980 and still holds to for a long time. You go to parasitic long axis view, you see a perimembranous VSD. Then inlet VSD means when you have only atrioventricular valves which are opened up. And then you have a muscular VSD through the interventricular septum. Supracrystalline subiotic, I like to show you in a couple of minutes in supracrystalline subiotic. This is the image which we draw by hands. If I go to short axis view at aorta, this is perimembranous. This is out, outlet muscular VSD. And this is known as subiotic or doubly committed VSD. Multiple name have been given to this particular phenomena is where this is just before the pulmonic valve. And this the ASD is almost always they're associated with aortic regurgitations. They have an aortic valve prolapse and hence they're associated with aortic regurgitations. Pathophysiology, the shunt is now at the level of interventricular septum, LA, LV, the blood flow to RV, then to pulmonic artery and back to pulmonic veins. So what will happen? The chambers dilated would be LA and LV and the flow across pulmonic valve increases to pulmonic artery and the pulmonic veins as well as through mitral wall. Now here is a plax window. You can't see any ASD over here, VSD over here. There's no LV dilatation. But as soon as you switch on the colors, you find a mid-muscular VSD. And now you can drive a gradient of this mid-muscular VSD. Here is mid-muscular VSD. Switch on the colors, you'll get a mid-muscular VSD. At this point, you can look what I was trying to show in previous picture was this is a parasitic short axis view. This is at the level of mid level, at the level of two papillary muscles, and you could see a mid muscular VSD. You can see a gradient across mid muscular VSD. That is a gradient across VSD is in paramembranous short axis view at papillary muscles. You can draw a line to see the gradient between LV to RV. Higher the gradients, good is the VSD. Poor the gradients, poor is the VSD. Last VSD, look at the colors. The colors are in bi directions. So this is where the PA pressures have gone much higher than expected. This is perimembranous. This was mid-muscular and this is doubly committed. Never ever try to measure the VSD because as soon as you start measuring VSD, you will measure three, the other will measure four. The patients will feel that VSD has become larger in size. What we measure? We measure always the gradient across this VSD. This one very special kind of a VSD is, as I was talking about atrioventricular, 
this is known as atrioventricular groove. The tricuspid valve is attached apically and the mitral valve is attached basally. So there's so-called an atrioventricular groove through which the VSD is present. This, and the VSD is between left ventricular to right atrium. Next comes the concept of VSD, whether it's restrictive versus non-restrictive. Restrictive means when the hole is smaller and the gradient across the VSD is larger. Non-restrictive means when the hole is bigger and the gradient is smaller. So if I look at this previous image over here, this is known as larger hole, non-restrictive VSD. Smaller hole, restrictive VSD. What is the implication of this restrictive versus non-restrictive VSD? Well, if the VSD has become non-restrictive, it means what? The patient's PA pressure have gone almost as good as systemic pressures. So then we have to really look for a pulmonary vascular resistance to talk about whether this patient will benefit after intervention or not. On the contrary, if this restrictive VSD, large gradients are present, obviously that is a small VSD with the gradients across LV that RV is much higher as compared to as compared to normal subjects. Next comes PDA or patent ductus arteriosus. Now the pathophysiology, the shunt has moved from this tricuspid valve over here, this interventricular septum to aorta and pulmonic artery levels. So what will dilate? LVLA will dilate in the subset of population. Now look at this subcostal window. We don't find any shunt across it. And on top of that, LVLA, that looks to be bigger as compared to RVRA. No ASD. And now I said rounded is aorta, pulmonic artery, pulmonic valve. It bifurcates to right as well as left. The right has gone over here and the pulmonic artery is connected with descending aorta, which is known as patent ductus arteriosus. This is large ductus, you could say continuous flow, insistently as well as diastole. This is known as ductal view. Like once you go to plaques window, as you look for RVRA flow, by putting your, by moving your transducer tip or the footprints towards mirror sinum, if you move your footprint towards left shoulder, you'll get a ductal view. And we can really look at the measured size of the ductus over here. Now, this is a subject. Look at dilated RV. Look at the bulging of septum in this patient. And now you see a much better septum bulge with, because every systolic contraction, RV has become bigger than LV. And when we look at a subcostal window, we cannot find any flow across this patent ductus arteriosus. Reason is the RV pressure has now become more than LV pressures. So the blood will be flowing from descending aorta, pulmonic artery to descending aorta. We may not find any shunt in this. What do we do? We give an agitated contrast saline. It will come and opacify the right side of the chest. But that's not alone. If you assess a descending aorta, you'll find if there's a shunt, which is patent ductus arteriosus, if the descending aorta find the bubbles, it means the bubbles have gone from left pulmonic artery to descending aorta, and finally you could interrogate in the subset of the patient. This is one patient which presented to us after doing a seven echocardiograms. His only problem was breathlessness, and nobody did a contrast echo showing that this RV pressure has gone much more than systemic pressure. We can have a VSD with PDA. 
many combination of GSD with PDA could be present. And at this point, I like to stop for a minute. And before stopping for a minute, this is what the coactation of aorta is. Ascending aorta, arch of aorta, descending aorta, and here's that coactation, post-ductal coartation in this subset of operation. And we do look at the gradients, which are almost four meters per second. If we take into consideration the patient's previous things, the pressure across this coactation of aorta is about 36 millimeters of mercury. Now you can see the two Doppler spectrum pattern across this coactation of aorta. This is again a diagram which talks about preductal and a ductal. Prior to ductus PDA or no prior to ductus PDA, that's what the imaging is. At your level, just whatever you identify, that looks more to be better. What is this type of a coactation of aorta? This is post-ductal. Last, bicuspid aortic valve. There are three raffae. All of us understand that we have got the three raffae over here. When this raffae fuses, this becomes straight enough. And when this only single raffae which is present, this is a unicuspid aortic valve. It presents like aortic stenosis. Only fact is when you consider in parasol short exclusion at aorta, you'll find that patient has got severe pulmonic, sorry, Severe bicuspid aortic valve stenosis. Now look at this. We can only see a two bicuspid aortic valves. Normally it's tricuspid. Then comes pulmonic stenosis. And here is an example for valvular or infundibular pulmonic stenosis. Look at this as well. And whole turbulence is seen over here. This is known as pulmonic stenosis. Supravalvular pulmonic stenosis. It means distal to the interrogation point that is supravalvular. And then comes subvalvular before the pulmonic that is subvalvular. And when the child is born, we have peripheral pulmonic arteriosclerosis. As I explained earlier, why so? This is right pulmonic artery, this is left pulmonic artery. So at this point, just few more. Now here's the example for FC anomaly. This is mitral valve inserted over here and the tricuspid valve have gone much higher at the point of insertion. Today there's a classification if I'm correct. If it displaces more than 55.5 centimeter, that's huge for a Epstein anomaly. Now the final journey for this subset of population of congenital heart disease. That is like we give them a penicillin prophylaxis if there's a shunts between them at the age of till 35 or lifelong. And if we are not having significant abnormalities and we are going for a intervention, then we can give a preload antibiotic. With this words, let me hold on my talk over here and take up your attendance as well as the question and answer sessions for this class.